Rolling Martin Unfiltered for Thursday, November 15, 2018. Mike Espy, who is running to be the next United States Senator in Mississippi, will be right here. If elected, he'll be the first black senator from Mississippi since Reconstruction. So we'll be talking to him about that run. Up next, also, uh, the ballots have been counted in Florida. And not good news for Andrew Gillum. He has lost that race for governor. And I'll tell you the number, how he lost by... And I got some serious questions for black people in two counties in Florida. Where in the hell were y'all on election day? And so we'll break down all the drama that's been happening in Florida as it relates to um, those ballots there as well. Also, we'll talk to Pam Keith, of course, of course, a former uh, elect, uh, person who ran for office twice, who's really been informing us about what's going down in Florida. Also, the president and CEO of NAACP, Derek Johnson, is here. We'll be talking about a number of issues, including the U.S. Civil Rights Commission report uh, that blasts the Trump administration's hands-off policy attitude toward police brutality and we'll also talk about uh, Nancy Pelosi. Will Congressman, Congresswoman Marsha Fudge of Ohio run against her to be Speaker of the House? A lot of folks are saying, oh, go ahead, let Nancy do it. But the Black Caucus is the largest caucus in the House Democrats. Should black folks step up and say we want the top position? We'll discuss it with our panel. Also, Facebook gets caught using anti-Semitism to slime color of change, and color of change is not happy. They're blasting Facebook and demanding answers. And y'all know what? Another white man caught doing some stupid stuff. Now his ass unemployed. We'll tell you about the latest dumb white person who just do something stupid in America. It's time to bring the funk. I'm Roland Martin on the field Let's go. Folks, the election, of course, uh, was on November 6th, but we still have some contested races. Uh, you have some Democrats who are still winning in California and Maine, uh, increasing the Democrats' lead in the House. But it's not settled in the United States Senate. There is one race that is still uh, has not been decided, and that is in Mississippi, where Mike Espy, he is the former congressman from that state, also Secretary of Agriculture, uh, he, of course, uh, is running against an incumbent uh, who has no problem with public hangings. Of course, if elected, he could be the first African. American elected to to the U.S. Senate from Mississippi since Reconstruction. Now here's the p deal: on November 27th, it's going to be a runoff. Uh, it was Cindy Hyde Smith and Mike Espy who got the two highest vote totals in on November 6th, and they are trying to replace that Cochran, of course, who retired uh, for health reasons. Now Mississippi has the highest concentration of African Americans of any state in the country, uh, 37 to 40 percent. Now the race again is between Cindy Hyde Smith, uh, who was appointed to replace Thad Cochran, as well as Mike Espy. Now, here's the piece. Uh, whoever wins the most votes on November, tw no November 27th, they win the remaining term of Thad Cochran. Uh, so right now, let's go to uh, Mike Espy, who joins us uh, from Mississippi. How you doing, doctor? Hey, Roland. Hi, good afternoon. Uh, Thanks for uh, having me on your show. So uh, I, I hear your voice is a little hoarse. That means you've been talking a whole lot uh, across Mississippi, trying to get <laughs> folks uh, uh, to vote. Uh, so first and foremost, uh, your uh, opponent, uh, she still refuses to apologize for her ridiculous comment about uh, if she was invited to a public hanging, she'd be sitting there on the front row. Uh, that comment is, is just stunning, not because she's running against an African-American, but yes. for her to say that, well, that's what you say when you hold someone in essentially high regard. Yes. I, I don't know anybody who I hold in high regard. I'm going to say, let's go to a public hanging. Hey, Roland, I'm, I'm 64 years old. I was born and raised in Mississippi. I thought I heard every Southern colloquialism ever, ever be uttered, but I, I confess to you, I've never heard anything about any sort of public hanging. So I mean, you know, it was shocking, it was uh, ugly, 
It was disappointing, harmful, really harmful because it reinforces all these negative stereotypes that people like like myself, people like like us, we've tried to overcome these. And so here you go. It's 2018. We're about going into the third decade of the 21st century. We got to revisit all of this, and it's just just wrong. When you talk about critical issues in Mississippi, uh, you have been uh, not focused on the issue of you being black, her being white. Uh, you have not been having even been focusing on Trump and the caravan was happening in D.C. Uh, you really stuck to core issues affecting the state. Uh, how do you believe that that is going over uh, in Mississippi uh, with the voters there, black and white? Going well, over very well because we saw the results of it Tuesday a week ago. You know, we essentially are tied with Sydney Hyde Smith, even though she got support of President Trump, the governor. Uh, you know, the leadership of the U.S. Senate, who are Republicans, and a lot of the corporate support. We tied her 41 41, even though she outspent us 5 to 1. And I did that based on focusing on the issues. In Mississippi, the number one issue in Mississippi, as it is across the country, is all about health care. You know, we had five rural hospitals to announce their bankruptcy or their closing within the last four months. And that's because the leadership of our state did not accept the Medicaid expansion money that was offered to them under the tenure of President Obama. So now those chickens are coming home to roost. You know, they, there's uncompensated care, and those hospitals that used to have that little piggy bank of the Medicaid money, uh, that piggy bank now is bad. There's also the issue, you know, of our pre existing conditions, whether hypertension, heart disease, you know, uh, diabetes, obesity. When you go to the doctor now, you know, because the, the, the vote lost by one vote, and Senate has been voted against it. There's now a fear of insurance companies now in Mississippi uh, 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 denying you coverage based on your pre existing illness. And that affects black, white, young, old, whatever gender. And so those are the issues that I've been focusing on. And those are the issues that are, res that are resonated with the people here, which is why we did so well. But how do you get white people, broke as hell white people, to understand? that they literally are voting against their own economic interest when they vote for Republicans who want to get rid of the Affordable Care Act, uh, yes. who don't want to have Medicaid expansion. This is not just Mississippi. We've seen this in North Carolina. We've seen this in Alabama. Look, in Kentucky, they elected a Tea Party governor. They voted for Donald Trump, and these broke white folks were crying and saying, oh, my God, I hope they don't touch my Affordable Care Act. I'm like, yeah. what the hell y'all thinking? Roland, you do it. You have to go to them where they are. You have to explain to them, you know, that they can't vote for for issues that are alien to their interests. And, you know, we've done this before. we made this uphill climb before. When I ran for Congress in 1986, I was 30 years old. And we won in a district that was about 50 percent black population, right? But if you discount for voting age and registration, it was more like 47 percent. So we won that district then in 1986. Uh, with 85% of the black vote, but 11% of the white vote. So when I ran again, you know, I ran in 86, 88, 90, 92. I never lost a race for Congress. We won that last race with 95% black and 40% white. And that difference between 11 and 40 was all about service. They know that uh, I'll represent them, whether they're white or black, whatever the, the income issue is, they just know that I would represent them, and I'll do the same thing here. So now it's been 20 years since I've run for anything, and some of them have forgotten me. So now it's just my job and the job of my campaign to go to them and just say, look, you know, when your child, you know, the path to success is through the college door. Don't you want to Don't you want to have someone to help you have your child get through that college door without inordinate debt? And when they graduate from that college, whether it's Ole Miss, Mississippi State, or Jackson State, or wherever, don't you want to make sure they graduate with no student debt or very little debt? So. You know, at some point, this message is going to break through. It already has because, you know, Roland, I can't win with black votes alone. I have to have enough crossover votes to do it. And we saw record crossover votes Tuesday before uh, last. So I think we're going to do all right. You have to have crossover votes, but let's just be honest. You need a massive black turnout uh, that is 80, that first of all, bare minimum is 80% in those yeah. counties, really 85, 90. 
What are yes. you doing to do that? Are you, what are the boots on the ground? Uh, what is the turnout plan? Uh, how are you reaching these folks? Because the other problem is uh, you got a short window. The election yes. is, 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 of course, the Tuesday after Thanksgiving. And so, yes. frankly, a lot of people are tuning out beginning next Tuesday, if you will. Uh, right. And then the problem is the election is a week later. Well, we have to first make sure that they understand that it's okay to have Thanksgiving and celebrate your families and praise the Lord for what He's given all of us. But you know, uh, don't get uh, don't get lazy, okay? And you know, uh, you got to get up and you got to come out that next succeeding Tuesday and come and vote for your future and go ahead and dispatch your civic obligation. So you ask me how we're going to get out the black vote, and I, I agree with you. Uh, we got to have a massive black turnout. So I think we will do it in four ways, just as we did it, you know, a week ago last Tuesday. What is really, um, you know, sort of what Doug Jones did in, in Alabama. What is is uh, using the iPads and going into the neighborhoods, canvassing, you know, who's in the house, their propensity to vote, you know, how long it's been since they voted, what cereal they had that morning. We know all of that. We have a large team of canvassers that have really been out the last two weeks, you know, in that in that mechanism. So that's the new school. Then, of course, you can't forget the old school. That's going through the political leaders, you know, and, the, and uh, I know the NAACP is nonpartisan, but we do have people who are NAACP members who are also, you know, advocating for us and doing that on their own time. So, and then the other groups, the, the, the fraternities, sororities, the Masons, the Eastern Stars, they're all out there for me. The third thing you have to do is, of course, the churches. You know, we have a large contingent of churches with pastors that are already and uh, invigorated, and again, our poets to tell their parishioners and those in their church do not forget about both of my guests on, on the 27th. And then the last thing is Cindy Hyde Smith, which she said to stir up the vote. She said it, you know, about these public hangings. So no one is going to forget that. She has incited passions in the black community like you've never seen before. And they're not going to forget that. And I think uh, I think she's going to be sorry she said that. Last question Last for you. Question. You yeah. have a big debate taking place on Tuesday night uh, there in Jackson, Mississippi. Uh, what is going to be your focus? What are you trying to get accomplished in that debate? Well, I mean, I'm going to ask every question that they ask. And of course, I'm not sure what those questions will be. But I just want to make sure everyone listening on uh, understands that I'm very competent. I'm very experienced. I completely understand the issues, you know. It's at the, um, the, the at a farm center, and you're going to be debating the guy who was sec United States Secretary of Agriculture. So I'm, I'm very familiar with those issues. But beyond that, we're going to talk about education, health care, student debt. Uh, they want to talk about global issues. We'll be ready for those, too. But I want to tell everybody that I don't care about your gender, about your race, about your sexual orientation or your disability, uh, your religion, even your party. I don't care. I'm a Democrat. I am, but I'm a small I independent Democrat. I will I will be accessible to everyone. I'll be independent. No one can tell me how to vote or who to see. And I'm just whatever whatever I can do to promote the interests of Mississippi first, that's what I'm gonna do, and that's my uh, position in this debate and what I'm gonna try to bring across. Well, I'll be in I'll be in uh, Mississippi on Monday. The Be Woke Vote folks, of course, uh, our effort is to uh, encourage as many people to vote as possible. So we'll be on the ground Monday. And then of course, uh, uh, let Pastor Jerry Young know that I'll be uh, there speaking to those pastors. He's assembling on Tuesday at 11 a.m. Uh, there in yeah. Jackson as well. He asked me uh, to say a few words. And so we certainly will be there as well. So we'll be doing Roland Martin Unfiltered from Mississippi on Monday and Tuesday. Uh, and so we look forward to being there. Uh, and seeing what takes place. Uh, Mike Espy, we certainly uh, appreciate you coming on the show. Uh, good luck. Uh, and uh, uh, drink some hot water, lemon, and uh, honey to save that voice. <laughs> Thank you, brother. I look forward to seeing you, and I'll be there with Jerry Young. Thank you very much. All right. Thank you so very much. I want to go right now to our panel. Uh, joining us is Derek Johnson, president and CEO of the NAACP, former head of the Mississippi State Conference of the NAACP, so he knows this race quite well. Uh, also, A. Scott Bolden, attorney, a former head of the D.C. De Democratic Party. Unfortunately, he's also a Kappa. Uh, but mm -hmm. we've got him sitting next to, of there course, Dr. Greg Carr, chair of the Afro-American Studies Department at Howard University. Yes, and proud alpha man. <laughs> proud alpha. And uh, DJ Jordan, the director of the Pinkston Group as well uh, here. Uh, Derek, I want to go to you. We talk about uh, this race. Uh, people, I, 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 I've been corresponding with the people in Mississippi, and, and he, this is what's amazing to me. I've had black folks say, there's just no way he can win. 
in the general election, only 700,000 people voted for the three candidates on, on November 6th. We all know that in a runoff, it's typically a lot lower turnout. There are 750,000 Democrats in Mississippi. Black folks, huge percentage. He can actually win if there is a large turnout. It's a turnout game. This is not about uh, putting to communities outside of the norm of where he knows the votes will come from. Uh, Mississippi, 2.8 million population, average statewide election. We're looking at between 600,000 to 900,000 voter turnout. This midterm election turned over 700,000. That was a huge increase. The drop off for the, for the runoff is going to be substantial. If he can get black folks back out, he wins. If he don't, he won't. <laughs> this is not about appealing to individuals to convince them to vote for him because racial black voting in Mississippi is pro perhaps the strongest of any state outside of Alabama. Mm -hmm. And at the end of the day, the white folks are going to support him. He got them. He got it. He must get black folks back out to the polls. And uh, DJ, at the end of the day, again, if you're a Republican, uh, she's not a lock. Again, you look at the numbers. Now, granted, you had McDaniel, a Tea Party guy who was running, but he only got 17% of the vote. That's right. And so if you look at that total number, b barely 700,000 votes, that's, again, what that says is that whichever one of these candidates can generate 500,000 votes, that's likely the winner. And I think the concern there is that you might even have some Chris McDaniel voters stay home or write him in as well because they're still bitter about losing. So it's all about turnout. You could have a lot of different things impacting it. You're hearing about President Trump may come down there because they're worried about turnout as well. So this thing is far from over. Uh, Greg, what's very interesting is that the, the Democratic Party, what they are doing, something very similar to what they did in uh, Alabama, and that is keeping a very low profile, okay? Because the, the strategy is we don't want to basically anger white voters. We don't want to make a big, 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 a big deal out of this. But the reality is, that's not what happened in Alabama. Okay, there was huge amounts of attention, and the amount of energy on African Americans, the sisters who were being organized to turn out, played a role. And so I, I understand that theoretically, but that's not actually what happened in Alabama. There was a whole bunch of noise that led to people really sitting here driving the turnout machine in Alabama. That's how Doug Jones barely won. Absolutely, and I think that's why Mike Epsi opened with his remarks by quoting what happened with Doug Jones. You know, he's trying to thread a needle that's imminently threadable. I agree with President Johnson. If black folk come out, he named her as the fourth factor, but she, in fact, she's the first factor. Mm -hmm. Cindy Hyde Smith with this public lynching thing, and Mississippians know their history. The fact that the governor of Mississippi is related to the guy that killed Emmett Till, black folks are mad as hell in Mississippi. Now, if Tom Perez and them want to shake in their boots, if they want to put any boots on the ground, if they're not going to help Mike Epsi, they can still do what they need to well, do. Well, they have boots on the ground, but again, uh, this whole idea, Scott, of, of, of keeping this low profile, that's not how you get people to turn out. Mm -hmm. well, I mean, that's, that's you got true. to be in folks' face and pounding and pounding and pounding. That's true, but the Democrats are worried about that pounding and pounding means that Republicans and, and, and white folks will come out just as strong if you start pounding. I'm not endorsing that, but, but let me give you a little pushback because I agree with everything, and I think that it is winnable, but that 17% that went for the Tea Party candidate, where do they go? If only half show up, right? He's not getting, Espy's not getting that 8% or 8.5%. That's probably going to go to the uh, incumbent. So how does he combat that in your equation for how he can win? Very, very, very simple, Derek. Look, you know Mississippi very well. Mm -hmm. When you look at the numbers, there are counties in Mississippi that are 50 and 60 and 70% black. Yes. He's got to hit 80 to 90 percent in those counties. Well, he would get the percentage of those who vote from the black community. Is the question is, will he have enough black folks to vote? Mm -hmm. Right. And let's not let's Offset not assume. So it's not right. 85, 90 percent. It's right. how many how comprise many 85, 90 percent. Right. And I'm gonna break this thing down in a second. We talk about Florida, mm -hmm. and I'm gonna show you what happens when black folks don't turn out. And let's be very clear, the Democratic Party is not playing a low profile in Mississippi. There is no infrastructure the Democratic Party has invested in over time. Because The disinvestment Democrats... in the South over the last 20 years has crippled the ability of the National Party to play. Politics are, are bottom-up, not top-down. Because they and keep we... saying, 
we, we, we can't, can't win. win. We can't win. And you can't you can't win you can't if you out. never try to win. This is right. about consultants. This is about consultants. Yeah. White consultants who, who, who drive the conversation to areas and states where they can generate more revenue. Mm -hmm. In the South, it's a black game. You can't, Period. you can't come out of the Southern primary without coming black. Bernie Sanders, South Carolina, he lost. Why? Because he had no relationship with Jim Clyburn and the black community. Mm -hmm. And when you leave out of the South Carolina primary, you in Super Tuesday black reality. And the Democratic Party in the South is a black reality, and the National Party has disinvested in that reality. And DJ, uh, DJ, yeah. Repu yeah. DJ like Republicans Pico. have right. benefited right. Right. But by Democrats not running, and this is what we saw this year. You saw Democrats in North Carolina run, everywhere. run in every positions. They flipped 10 or 12 seats in North Carolina. They flipped 10 seats in Texas. It's very simple. If you don't run, you, you ain't got no win. shot at winning. That's right. You got to have a ground game. You got to have people running everywhere. And that's what benefits some of the statewide Democrats who ended up winning like in Nevada mm -hmm. um, and like elsewhere as well. And I'm telling you, the Chris McDaniel piece is real. His supporters <laughs> are diehard. It's a cultish following, and they may not come out. Very so if you have black, folks. If you got black folks who come out, it's going to uh, really yep. change that whole dynamic. But 2018. But, 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 but hold on one second. I gotta go to the next story because I, I, because this again speaks to. I'm gonna link these two, okay. uh, folks. The machine recount numbers were due this afternoon in Florida, and the result is that Ron DeSantis has beaten Andrew Gillum for governor. And here are the numbers here. Uh, that I want to pull up, uh, and so Ron DeSantis, this is as of uh, 6.02 p.m. Uh, from uh, the Associated uh, Press. Ron DeSantis got 4,075,000, guys, do you see my iPad? There we go, 4,075,473 votes. Andrew Gillum, 4,041,775. What that means, folks, is that Andrew Gillum lost the governor's race in Florida by 33,693 votes. Now, here's something that's happening there. A judge has given thousands of voters with rejected ballots time to fix the signature problems. More than 3,700 ballots are in dispute, and voters have until 5 p.m. Saturday to fix any signature mismatch problem. Now, Governor Rick Scott is appealing that because he, of course, uh, wants to win. He is leading incumbent Senator Bill Nelson by just 12 thousand votes. Palm Beach County did not finish their machine recount in time and the Nelson campaign has filed a lawsuit to have a hand count uh, because they say the machines are failing. They're overheating in Palm Beach County. Now Florida Secretary of State has ordered a hand recount all over the state. state and Nelson isn't unlikely to gain enough to, uh, to win unless the undervote in Broward County for Senate is corrected with a manual recount that started today. Attorney and activist Pam Keith joins us right now from Florida. Uh, and Pam, uh, obviously uh, bad news for the Gillum campaign, uh, but uh, for Democrats, they are holding out hope that with these ballots and by doing a hand recount, that Bill Nelson could somehow make up 12,000 votes to surpass, Bill, to, to, to surpass Rick Scott. Yeah, Roland, um, it is it is kind of sad news because of the machine recount. And you did report accurately that Palm Beach County, which is where I live, um, had real problems with these machines. They are antiquated. The machines in Palm Beach County for, were from 1997. And so they were overheating, they were jamming, and that slowed down the machine recount. Um, I do know that uh, what I reported to your listeners and your viewers uh, about the vote-by-mail uh, uh, fixing problem, you know, be able to fix those signatures. The court ruled this morning that uh, people have to be given an opportunity to uh, cure defective uh, signatures by 5 p.m. on Saturday. So, uh, frankly, what's next? It, well, obviously, the manual recount is underway, both for Nelson um, and Nikki Fried has been declared the winner for our agriculture. So we at least picked up a cabinet seat for Democrats. Um, that's good news. The manual recount is underway, um, and that's going to take into consideration both these vote by mail ballots that are getting cured, the undervote in Broward County, um, and any other disputed ballots. But I think at this point, the, the, the reason the, the race was called is they just felt there were not enough votes to make up a 33,000 vote gap for Andrew Gillum. All right, then, with Pam Keith, we certainly appreciate you uh, informing us of what's going on there, keeping us updated, uh, and thanks a bunch.
Thank you. Have a good night. All right, then. I'm going to go to my panel here. Henry, go to my iPad. I want you all to see this here. So this is from the Tallahassee Democrat, and I saw this. This is in the Florida counties with the highest turnout. Ron DeSantis beat Gillum. Now, I want you all to see this. If you, Again, for all the people who are at home, I, I need you to understand this. When we talk about turnout, okay, you have to ignore percentages. That means nothing. Because if you could say, oh, so-and-so got 90% of the black vote. Well, if that's 200 people, that means nothing. But if it's 2,000 people, that's a huge difference. Okay, so look at this chart right here. Red, these are the counties that had the highest turnout in Florida. Sumter, 77.68%. Jefferson, 75. Collier, 73. Franklin, 70%. Now, these are not the most populous counties. The difference is, and again, all you young voters, listen to me carefully. These voters are old people. <laughs> I keep telling all of these young people who are millennials, who are Gen Y, who are Generation Z, whatever you want to letter you want to throw on it, stop running your damn mouth and realize that the people in America who vote are old people. That's who determined this election. You want to understand this here? Look, you have to go 10 deep to get to a Democratic county mm. that, had, that got 68%, did not even get to 70%. Let's keep going down. Seminole County. Y'all notice something. The two most populous counties in Florida not are not seen yet. Mm -mm. Let me keep going. Do you see where Palm Beach is? Okay, let me go back to the top. That's the top. This, folks, is Palm Beach. 63.44%. Duval, Jacksonville, 62.70%. We still haven't got to the most populous county in Florida. Let me go further. Do you see it? No. 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 Let me go further. Wow. Let me go further. Broward County, 57.28% turnout. Miami-Dade, 56.89% turnout. Andrew Gillum lost by 33,000 votes. If Miami-Dade by themselves turned out at 70%, he runs away with the job. If Broward turns out at 70%, it's not even a close competition. Where are the rich black voters in terms of that Andrew Gillum was depending on Miami-Dade and Broward. How many times was Obama in Miami-Dade? How many times was he in Broward? Derek, this is the point. I talked to some Gillum people and they said, man, they think the day before the election, polls said Gillum was going to win by four points. People were like, oh, he got it in the bag. You don't win jack until ballots are counted. This is turnout. It's not only is it a turnout, it is a question for election reform in ways in which we have to expand what our imagination is. One thing she said earlier, that the, the machines in Palm Spring was from 1997. Palm Beach, yeah. Palm Beach. That's malfeasance. But as a result yeah. of the 2000 election, we had the Help American Vote Act, where every state received a, a bunch of money to buy new machines, and it was up to the individual counties to purchase the machines. That means Palm Beach County didn't purchase new machines. Right. That's point one. Point two, if we stop talking about democracy in this bubble of the Voting Rights Act and expand, Australia, 96% of the population vote. Over 200 countries use compulsory voting as the mechanism to turn out. In Canada, 92%. In Germany, 93%. And we are saying it's a good turnout if we're talking about 70%. That's not representative government. Part two, we have to stop listening to polls. They are wrong. Mick Romney didn't have a concession speech in 2012 because all the polls said he was going to win. He lost. Trump didn't have a, 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 a succession speech in 16 because he just knew he lost. He won. We cannot rely on polls because the only poll that matter is the final count at the end of the elections. And then finally, 
If we really begin to understand the nature of politics, it is never about the party running the game. It's about the people running the party. Right. Parties are vehicles for agendas. And those agendas are set by the constituency base that make up the party. We have to stop looking for something coming out of D.C., whether it's Republican or Democrat, to run the game. It's a bottom-up game, not a top-down. That's the lessons for the civil rights movement. It's not about a speech from an individual. It's the collective consciousness of the communities that move the needle, not in Selma, but in Lowndes County, Alabama, where you're seeing the true nature of power being demonstrated. Scott, I know somebody's watching, and they're saying, oh, Roland, you blaming black people. No. What I'm saying is, them white folks in those red counties, they showed up. Yeah. And the reality is, Republicans, if you, if you win, your people show up. There you go. And if you Democrats, if you win, because your people show up. At the end of the day, those who show up, they determine who the winner is. And if you, that's why I use the phrase, vote or shut the hell up. Right, right. <laughs> it, 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 we got to do something differently. I, I agree with everything you said. At the same time, though, what we're doing, how we're doing it, how creative we're getting. I mean, we're really, we're really doing the Republicans' work for them by not showing up because they show up. But we got to figure out a way, Roland, to get Go TV, get out the vote, and voter education differently. Because we spend millions, if not more, on voter education, get out the vote every two years in every election. But that's the and problem, our Scott. Don't vote. No, but that's, but that's the problem. What, what's the problem? I'm, it, I'm no, saying it is. No, it's because what we haven't done, Greg is we haven't paid attention to our own history. Dorothy Cotton's job with SCLC was citizenship education. You could not say, I'm rolling Dr. King. No, you're not. You got to go through that program, and when Dorothy Cotton say, you are ready to go out, then you can go out. And it's in your her, round. Yes. Right. In her book, she said, they brought them in, they, need, they, they assess what was in your brain, right. and then they said they reprogrammed you, right. then sent you out. That's right. What has to happen is we have to return to citizenship education. That's right. That is year-round. Teaching people, Greg, teaching them, this is what county commissioners do and city councilmen do Absolutely. and DAs mm -hmm. and what the judges do Absolutely. and walking people through it Absolutely. because people are walking around utterly clueless. Absolutely. And then they say, well, you know what? Literally, I got people right now uh, who are on, I see you on Facebook, uh, and they're saying, well, Andrew Gillum, he never said what he was going to do specifically for black people. Come on. Oh, it's a whole bunch of these people out here. And I and, and look, and I've been calling them out for two weeks who keep saying, well, if you don't pre present a specific black agenda, well, guess what? The white folks sure showed up. Puerto Rican sure showed up. That's right. And really, if you were paying do? attention, Greg, he was talking about stuff that was specific to us. But those are excuses to me. Oh, yeah. Your thoughts, Rick? No, I agree. I mean, and I agree with what, what Brother Johnson has said. I mean, if you look at Septa McClark in, in South Carolina, citizenship education. Let's contrast this. You have these poor white people who have voted against their interests. They have elected a clown to be the governor of Florida who is going to harm them. We just heard Mike Epstein talking about these rural hospitals closing. What you have in America is a race-based country where white people are voting against their own interests, and citizenship education is not just a lens for black folk. It is the lens through which citizens begin to participate in their best interest. Citizenship education should be something we're all engaged in. Yep. And what Gillum and, and, and Stacey Abrams have done in Florida, and this speaks to the question which you were raising, Derek, about the question of no infrastructure in the South. I think they have begun, they've laid the foundation for rebuilding a new Democratic Party in those two states. And this election, yeah, it may have slipped out of our fingers. Mm -hmm. But when this next election cycle comes out, I think we'll begin to see the benefit if they seize this momentum and do exactly what you're saying, put that education at the forefront of the next uh, the next election cycle. For instance, DJ, Proposition 4 passed in Florida, 1.4 million people uh, who were formerly incarcerated now have the right to vote. Now the question is, yes, that passed, but who is going to be driving that initiative to register those 1.4 million folks? Because that can have an impact on 2020. Well, Republicans normally implement a, you know, a const uh, if you have a vote like that, they're going to implement it. I mean, this is not something where they're going to try to um, well, First to of all, they can't, they can't mess with it because this is not in a state constitution. Right, right. So they can't, they can try, <laughs> but it's in the constitution right. now. So I want to say something, uh, DeSantis or whatever, was uh, a mediocre candidate, in my opinion, but you still had you get no coming out. Exactly. Okay, we, we agree there. But you also had a, a candidate on the Democratic side who campaigned on very progressive issues, and one of those issues was Medicare for All. 
And so if you're talking about changing Medicare in a state with all these old people, they're going to get fearful. They're going to get scared. And so I think... Medicaid for all? When you're advocating yeah. Medicaid for all, they're going to get scared. Absolutely. If you, if you would have saw, uh, if you would have saw some of the commercials, sure. they were talking. DeSantis was talking about how he is going to change and wreck Medicare. Yeah, because for it's Medicare a clown for all. And there were clowns listening. But I'm Race just telling you. I am just let's telling you. Let's, let's, let's but, 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 but check this out. You got SB. You got SB in in Mississippi who is not campaigning on these Bernie Sanders national issues. He is focusing on Mississippi. Right. He's talking about free trade. He is talking about business economy. He's talking about health care in a way that people can understand it. But when you talk about reforming Medicare in a state that has that many seniors, that's going to drive people out, and that's why you saw that many people come out. Go ahead. Let's be clear. Florida is, in, is a southern state. White folks vote against their interests right. if you infuse race, Right. religion or region that's, right. that's the driver the how we intellectualize the outcome is great for discussion but it's not the reality on the ground black man on camera running for governor <laughs> we can't get him that's has right. nothing to do with his message it's all nothing race that's it's right. all about race <laughs> that is the reality of the south it has been that way since after reconstruction when the redeemers took back control of southern states hmm. they used they've used the tool of race the otherness to create a us against them to maintain domination and control over the mode of production and cheap labor. That has carried out in the fabric of the culture of white supremacy throughout the South, but, and we're seeing it emerge, emerge all across the country. But Gillum only lost by 30,000 votes. The, so doesn't that fly in the face of your, of, of your, uh, what you said? What absolutely you not, because no, much, of, much, much of that culture is, is breaking up, because some younger but whites... they're competing in but, those states in Georgia. And, no, no, and no, you no, got no, people no, moving no, to Florida no, from no, other states in the Northeast, yes, so yes, half it, of the people voting there have not even lived in Florida for the last no, 10 no, years. Not, not, they're not, they're no, coming no. from New York. Hold on, hold on, hold on. Hold on. Where, I can no, no, you look at where... I, I'm, in, the, I'm the born outcome. and raised in Texas, but people who move to Texas take on the ways of other Texans. <laughs> right, right, right. And if you look at where those high performers... You're calling the whole state racist. No, like no, no. So hold on, hold on. No, no. Stop right there. Hold on, hold on, hold on. Hold on, everybody. Hold up. Stop right here. See? <laughs> now, it's your first time on the show. <laughs> <laughs> I'm about to baptize you. <laughs> okay? See? That's a nice little cheap-ass trick to work on Fox News. Uh, it don't work here. Uh, <laughs> see, here's what happened. When you say or you call it the whole state racist, what ends up happening? It's a racist versus a non-racist conversation. No. The reality is race is infused in the politics based upon people's perceptions how people view certain people, how they view certain issues. You may say, oh, no, 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 I'm not a racist, but you are making race-based decisions in your voting. But we can see it in campaign commercials. We can see it in certain language. If race wasn't a role in Florida, the white nationalists would not have been running robocalls for DeSantis against Gillum in Florida. If race, race, wasn't, if, if race wasn't an issue, then you would not have had Donald Trump calling mm -hmm. Andrew Gillum a thief. If race oh, wasn't around. around. See, mm -hmm. see again, no. Right. So, no, no, no so here's the deal. Here's that's the deal. Right. We, right. we, we all know and understand. No. That's right. Oh, you're calling a black man a thief. We know, how, we know that game. So the reality is people do make race-based decisions even when they say, I got black friends. Derek. And, and just because people move to Florida, it don't change who they were before they moved. <laughs> Racism is not a southern unique reality. Say that again. But more importantly, the counties you where just the said that it was. So right? no, 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 no. I never said that. You said let, let, dynamics let, in the read south. Read my lips. Race. What I say is what I said, right? <laughs> and if you look at rural Florida, that's where many of these indigenous southern whites live. That's where you had the highest turnout based on race base. Many of the people you're talking about, they moved to some of the counties where Andrew Gillum actually won. Yeah. But at the end of the day, fear politics is not unique to the South, but although it was perfected in the South, it was perfected around race and religion. Two men getting married, a woman having an abortion, or the fear of the big black guy, or the immigrants coming across the border, mm -hmm. although they are three days away or three weeks away, oh, right. let me, I'm gonna go send the troops down there. It's all playing on fear, not policy or, or politics. Which is and why, which is why I go back to turnout. In this last election, right. it was 71, 72% the total electorate was white. 
2020 will be the first time in American history the total electorate will likely fall under 70%. Mm -hmm. What that still means, though, Iraq keeps talking about the Obama coalition. The Obama coalition depends upon uh, college-educated whites right. and millennials voting at higher numbers. It also depends upon Which blacks and Florida Latinos twice. voting. Right, but it, it, depends, it depends upon them voting at higher numbers. The point I'm trying to make to black people, we can't take elections off. Our numbers must be maintained in turnout, not percentage, but turnout at high numbers because higher turnout among African Americans can overtake average turnout among white voters. Right. And that's what I'm saying. Gillen will be governor right now had you had higher, if Broward County and Miami-Dade not even hit 70%, if Miami-Dade and Broward had had 65% yep. of turnout, That's right. Andrew Gillum is governor. But you, you yeah, know, but turnout. You're, still, you're still not getting to the crux issue, and that is, why aren't they voting? Right. They have every motivation right. to vote. No, saying, All the money spent, why aren't they voting, though? In the end, why aren't they voting? It's because who's talking to Greg, go ahead. No, it's, it's education. It's citizenship education. I mean, mm -hmm. we, and, but, but it's one other thing. Epsi, the 27th is the election is still out there. I agree with you, Jerry. They can get that seat. And people forget in Texas, Ted Cruz basically got his seat in the, in the United States Senate because of an off cycle election. But so low voter turnout, he got bombarded it. Scott, with Scott, ads. No, no, Scott, no, 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 Scott, 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 it's not ads. Right. Scott, it's not ads. The issue here, again, it goes back to education. When I am out talking to people, when I'm talking to people, when I give speeches all across the country, I cannot tell you, and I've done. I, I, I probably done more Freedom Fund dinners than Derek. <laughs> <laughs> Turn it over to you. I, I, it's all good. I appreciate it. 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 Because I ain't got nothing free. <laughs> oh, but I can raise y'all money. I'm just letting you know. You and I can get you new members. Who you say? Right. right. All right. That's right. That's a chapter, that's a chapter in Gainesville when they had their membership call. Yes. And I said, sister, I got this here. And guess what? They had 50 new members that night. Arlington, Texas. I got them church, 90 new members. God bless you. So, but, but here's the deal. When I'm giving speeches, I'm connecting the dots. Yes. Mm -hmm. The problem is we live this. Yeah. Okay? We live this. Yeah. The average person out there They're not engaged. doesn't right. understand. That's right. Mm -hmm. Oh, wait a minute. I hear mass incarceration. What you going to do, President? No, it's only 200,000 people in federal prisons. It's 2.1 million in state and local jails. Mm -hmm. Who is your DA? Mm -hmm. Who are the judges? Yes. And then it goes you the light bulb. Dots. Goes on. That's right. A sister called me in 2016, and she said, when I had my radio show, she said, you know, Roland, I'm sorry. I don't like Hillary. I don't like Trump. So I'm not going to bother the presidential election. I'm going to focus on state issues. I said, really? Mm. I said, what you going to focus on? She said, well, I'm going to focus on, on voter suppression. I said, well, you do know the North Carolina voter ID law mm -hmm. went to the Supreme Court. And you do know who appoints mm -hmm. the, the, the Supreme Court justices, right. the president. I said, you do know it went through the federal courts. You do know who appoints the federal judges, the president. president. She, mentioned some other, she, she mentioned some other issues. I said, well, let me show you how federal plays a role in that. <laughs> mm -hmm. It was yeah. her right. top five issues. Mm -hmm. <laughs> well, federal. No, no, no. <laughs> she thought they were state issues. Right. Yeah. She had no understanding the role the federal them. government played mm -hmm. on those state issues. Right. Mm -hmm. So she thought by sitting out the presidential race, I'm good. And I said, you lost your damn mind. Right. She had no understanding of it. And so people, and so the education part, the training, and so what has to happen is there are, churches, uh, organizations should be saying every single week, we're going to have citizenship education exactly. training every exactly. week. You Come and learn about your local politics. I grew up, the, my parents were the founders of a civic club. And guess what it was? People said, well, you know, man, them abandoned houses. How do we get rid of abandoned house? Mm -hmm. Okay, mm -hmm. that's the city. Mm -hmm. Okay, that might be mm -hmm. jurisdiction of the county. That's right. right. This might be the jurisdiction of the school district. That's right. So then they say, well, we're going to go to these people. And regular, ordinary people learn how to transform their community that's right. by figuring out and learn, okay, oh, who, you control this? Mm -hmm. Oh, you control this? Oh, I need to set up police patrols. Well, I ain't going to go to the councilman. I'm gonna go to the police commander right. for my neighborhood. Right. That was right. training. Right. The neighborhood was revitalized because people were trained. Right. Derek, th th that's it. 
There has to be massive yeah. citizenship training in the black community. And other people as well. We got to start it with young kids. Every week. No, no. We got to start it with everybody. We got to start with everybody. Yeah. Final comment on this topic before I go to the break. You notice civics is no longer taught in many schools. Right. And the people we're talking about, they see themselves as victims of government, not owners of government. Right. Mm -hmm. And we have to go so they can see that mm -hmm. they own this. These are their tax dollars. These are not the lazy people sitting down. These are people who work every day cleaning the hotels, working no at the restaurants. No and they don't see themselves as owner of a system. Because right. Right. they have been perse persecuted by that very system. Mm -hmm. All right, folks, got to go to a break right now. When we come back, we're going to talk about the race for Speaker of the House. You get a black woman from Ohio who says she is thinking about challenging Nancy Pelosi. Does our panel think that's a good idea? Next on Roland Martin Unfiltered. Hey everybody, this is Sherry Shepard. You're watching Roland Martin Unfiltered. And while he's doing Unfiltered, I'm practicing the wobble. Yes, I am. Because Roland Martin's the one, he will do it backwards, he will do it on the side. He messes everybody up when he gets into the wobble. Because he doesn't know how to do it, so he does it backwards. And it messes me up every single time. So, I'm working on it. I got it. You got Roland Martin. Hi, my name is Latoya Luckett, and you're watching Roland Martin Unfiltered. What's going on, everybody? It's your boy, Mac Wiles, and you are watching Roland Martin Unfiltered. What's up, y'all? It's Ryan Destiny, and you're watching Roland Martin Unfiltered. What up, Lana Well, and you are watching Roland Martin Unfiltered. <laughs> All right, folks, Nancy Pelosi says she has all the votes needed to become the next Speaker of the House, but other Democrats say, uh, hold your horses. No, you don't. And one of the folks who said they may very well challenge her for the role is Marsha Fudge. She's a congresswoman from Ohio. She was the first female and first black mayor of Warrensville Heights, a suburb of Cleveland. Uh, she served there for eight years. She was also chair of the Congressional Black Caucus from 2013 to 2015. Uh, Hillary Clinton appointed her permanent chair of the DNC convention in 2016 after, the, after Debbie Wasserman Schultz resigned as head of the party. Now Fudge, uh, who is 66 years old, uh, she says she has been overwhelmed by support for her bid. Now again, she has not decided whether she's actually going to challenge Pelosi. Uh, and so you got lots, of course, uh, lots of uh, dancers going back and forth. Uh, Jim Clyburn has announced that he is going to run for majority whip. Uh, that's the third highest ranking position among the hierarchy. You also have Congresswoman Barbara Lee and Congressman Hakeem Jeffries, both African-Americans, say they will run to be head of the Democratic caucus. Go to our panel here. Uh, and I, see, I already know some of y'all going to go ahead and run y'all miles. Don't even try it. Uh, we had a couple of female panelists who dropped out today. Uh, and so they could not join us. <laughs> nice try, nice try, but I saw it coming. Uh, and so uh, here's, the, here's the deal here, folks. Um, people were saying, you challenge Pelosi, oh my God, you're challenging a woman. Could be a woman challenging her. Second, there's never been a black woman among the Democratic leadership or the Republican leadership uh, in Congress. It's ridiculous. Black women are the most important constituency in the Democratic Party. Mm -hmm. So the question for each of you, should Nancy Pelosi be challenged for Speaker of the House? Absolutely. 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 Because it, it's, it's, good, it's good for the blood of lifeblood. I mean, when Ocasio-Cortez is protesting, we get it, it's all cool. Fudge, by doing this, should be making a statement. You don't have a right to inherit the speakership. And it's interesting to see that Tim Ryan talk to her. Like, in other words, she's going to get support beyond the congressional Tim Ryan, of course, opposed Pelosi last time. Mm -hmm. uh, and, Tim, and, of course, Fudge did not support Pelosi. She backed Tim Ryan. Both are for, from Ohio. And, of course, Tim Ryan wants to run for president of the United States as Indeed. well. Greg, go ahead. No, 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 no. That's it. That's well, it. But, but, who, but so either you're in or you're out. Because the discussion is really moot at this point. You challenge Pelosi at your own political risk, though. She has raised millions of dollars around this country. She has been speaker before. She has been an iron-fisted speaker with a successful record of leadership as speaker. You challenge that at your own risk. But here's no the one piece, can though. match her record. But, but here's the piece, though, Derek uh, and DJ. There's no larger caucus in the Democratic Party. Than the black I don't and, if she try, and if she tries to bring a hammer down on Fudge for running against her, right. the black caucus... She won't have to. No, no, no. You just lose. No, no, she won't no, have no, to I got bring you. a Derek, go ahead. You know, it's, it's not only that Congresswoman Fudge and Congresswoman Barbara Lee is running. They are perhaps the most capable, yes. smartest members of Congress. Yes. Congresswoman Barbara Lee served as chief of staff for Ron Dellum for multiple years. She understands where all the bathrooms exist. She understands how to write a bill and, and how to interpret. 
that's the key here. We're talking about competent, capable well, women who are they're strong. Competent, though. No, I'm not they presuming. Win. No, I know. Not, I presume. Not, not just. I, no, but not just. I know them too. And I, not, no, 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 no. Not, I'm not just, saying no, 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 elections. Oh, no. no, elections I'm are. Can they win? Elections are nothing more than popularity contest. Exactly. Right. Now we have competent individuals. Now. Can they win? I'm not in the bubble of the Democratic caucus, therefore I don't know how the votes line up. Should they run? If they if they believe they can win, yes, they should run. And there is yeah. no hammer plus can bring down. Not only is the caucus the largest caucus, the black vote is the foundation of the party. I dare see someone but, try to retaliate against a member of the caucus or what happened. She's got outside organizations like the largest unions in this country supporting her and on the phone calling those very members well, saying we're back in Pelosi. Yeah, but, but, Don't but, do it. But, but let me, and, but, those very, and those very labor unions undermine their contributions to black members so there are no exactly. loyalties there. You're absolutely right. Therefore there's no hammer but, to bring. But, so DJ, they, DJ, here's what's interesting here. Okay, because this is what I've heard. I've heard all the people talk about how Democrats won the House because of Losi. Let's no, 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 hold on. Let, really. let, oh, let, let, no, 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 no. I said others have said. I, did I say you? Well, you were looking at me. <laughs> I was looking at you. <laughs> Stop looking at me and ask him. If question. I said it was you, I would have called your name. Here we go. See, I've been, I've been trying. Oh, to just because be you got a cute little flower you know, on your lapel, no, don't act like I'm gonna jump. I won't jump. I won't jump in that ass. Just let you know. Just let you know. Real men will I'm gonna beat you down so bad you're gonna be hollering, Erica, Erica, come get me. Get them off of me, Erica. Get them off of me. Come on. But DJ, here's the deal. Everybody forgets. Dems lost the house. Yeah. Under Pelosi. Under Pelosi. Right. Republicans, you lose the House, you don't come back as Speaker of the House. That's right. First of all, the Democrats did not take over the House because of Pelosi. They took over the House because of Donald Trump. So that's one thing that you got to be clear. And plus, Pelosi went into hiding in the last 30 days of the election. Did you guys see her no, out no, at no, all? No, 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 you didn't. no. She, she campaigned for Smart. different people. She but she wasn't, she wasn't in public events. So she wasn't well, doing press or whatever. It was a strategic move she's on her issue. part. So it what? was a strategic move because right. she knows that she is the boogeyman. Of the Republican and, uh, Party. The, the, she is the savior of the Democrats on the Hill. I wouldn't disagree. It worked in 2010. Speak, and you know what I'm talking about? So why did you have more than 20 individuals say that they would not support Pelosi and they're they're well, Democrats. Well, they're trying to run. Yeah. I mean, but, 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 but let's be clear. Twenty is nothing. There, go ahead. There, go ahead. Can I say this? Make this one point too. Look at the average age of Democratic leadership right now in the House. They're in the seventies. Sure. Okay. No, 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 Most no. Of the people, in the eighty. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no, no, no. They ain't in the seventies. They they not seventy five. No, they act like seventy eight, seventy nine. I'm that one. So the leadership is not reflected in the coalition that just won you that. I'm not a person who gets into ageism, particularly when you got the GOP men like Orrin Hatch doing like this. So I really don't have to. Plus, but, plus, plus, I see 81. She's with y'all ass. No, but, no but, but this is interesting. And Lauren Victoria Burke said this last week in, in the wake of we talking election coverage. You know, when you think about the fact that the CBC doesn't vote as a block, I mean, Jim Clyburn has already come out and said, I am voting for Pelosi. Mm -hmm. For me, it might be a strategic move for Marsha Fudge because if I had to pick between the two, and I agree with you, Derek, they're extraordinarily, they're beyond capable. They're extraordinary. Exactly. Right. I would prefer Barbara Lee go for it. But perhaps with these two sisters going up, they're going to get one of them in one of those leadership positions, and then two years from now, maybe they make the transition. I'm looking at Barbara Lee like she's... Let's, all, and let's also say this here. Right. Every time I hear somebody, including you, <laughs> talk care? about how much money Pelosi raised, let's just be honest, if you the damn Democrat minority leader, you're going to raise, you gonna raise money. Right? Gonna I mean, it's not, like, it's not like you <laughs> not going to raise Bro, money. Here's a question, <laughs> because I'm not, my, I'm not advocating that they don't run, because they're very competent. Here's the question, though, right? Mm. How do they win? What is their strategy? It may be inside politics, but listen, we all intellectualize politics. How does anyone challenging Pelosi win? Here's What's how you the strategy? Win. Here's how you win. First of all, she has to get, uh, she has to get a majority. 218. Here's I the piece. If she's mm -hmm. under the majority, let me tell you how it, let me tell you how it works. It works in that caucus. Interesting. You don't get 218 on the first round. That's right. Oh, the sharks come yeah. out, yeah. Yeah. and they start flipping. Mm -hmm. And so, what Fudge is likely doing, uh, they're sitting here going, okay, what are the numbers? Those freshmen, okay, how are they going to vote? You still have some, uh, you still have some Undone. races. Mm -hmm. Look, you just had the race in Maine that was just decided yesterday. That's exactly right. California, day before yesterday. Right. So you got several that are still outstanding. Right. If, if they're looking at 30, 40, 50, I think, I think when, I'm going to pull up in a second how much Ryan lost, I think he got 65. If all of a sudden she looks up and, you know, it's 90, 95, and here's the other piece, it's secret ballot. So right. when Pelosi says, I got the votes, well, that's one thing. 
The other thing is, I go back to the power of the Black Caucus. Will the Congressional Black Caucus be like the House Freedom Caucus? Mm -hmm. mm. The House Freedom Caucus was 30 members. Right. It's going to be like 54 or 55 black CBC members. Are they going to say, hold up, maybe four or five, maybe 10 go Pelosi? Mm -hmm. That means it's 40 or 45 over here like this here. You got 45 votes. Yeah, but do, Not, do I mean, colleagues look at the CBC and the House the way their the Republican colleagues looked at the no. Freedom Caucus? If, Are if they as powerful as the Freedom Caucus? They, now, they, I they, hold on, no, 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 no. The reason, that, the reason that's wrong, okay, you're wrong, because Nancy Pelosi, two years ago, she got pushed back saying leadership was too old. So she then said, okay, well, we're going to put term limits on the assistant position, yes. which Clyburn had. Yeah. But she created No, those no, no, positions. no, wait a minute. That's how Clyburn wait a, got Wait a there. minute. Mm. They had, first mm -hmm. of all, they had to. And they demoted it. No, no, no. no yes, no, they no, did. No, they no, demoted it. No, they, they did the not. Okay, okay, they did. Congressman from the Maryland. No, they no, put it. No, they, they didn't. didn't. No, no, they, they did didn't. Okay. No, they did not. When the Democrats were in control, they have a Speaker of the House, Majority Leader, Whip. Exactly. Top three positions. When you lose that, you have... Minor minority leader, mm -hmm. whip. You only have two real positions. He should have remained. They created that. They created third. So he was still in a third position, mm -hmm. like he was in leadership. Mm -hmm. What Pelosi did was, she said, "I'm gonna bump him down, put term limits on this thing for a younger member." Black Caucus said, so "You're not gonna do that." Really? Mm -hmm. The whole Black Caucus walked out the room. She was like. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. I guess that didn't go over well. well yeah. And guess what happened? Let me try something else. They all left, went to the office. All right. Guess who was the number three? Clyburn. Right. And let's, Derek. Let's right. not, Derek and Greg. Let's not forget that during the primary, there were several members of the caucus and other members that, that Pelosi and the DCCC didn't support. They supported incumbents. Those incumbents got beat. Right. Mm -hmm. Now those caucus members are about to walk into position, they have no loyalty to Pelosi because they were at Boston. Ayanna wasn't supported by Pelosi in the DCCC. Hold up, hold up, hold up. Right. Not just, not, hold up, not just, hold up, not just Pelosi. Mm -hmm. The CBC PAC right. did right. not support right. no, 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 Ayanna. No, no, no. They supported her no, opponent. The, the CBC PAC is not the CBC. Yes, they are. No, no, no. Yes, they are. CBC members supported Ayanna. There were some Some members. did. There were, no, Fudge did. Right. Richmond did. Right. B uh, Con but the, Benny but, did. But the CBC pack. It's, it's, it's two separate realities. Hold on. They ain't, they ain't really that we're separate. We're not, I, no, 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 I understand. No, no. Check. No, no. We, we, we got, but we I got, got you, four, Derek. We got, <laughs> I, got, I got you. We got four vehicles. <laughs> yeah. We got the CBC proper. Right. Uh, we got the CBC foundation. Right. We have the CBC institute. And we right. have the pack. Right. Everybody don't play with everything. But they really they do. But, but I got you. I got you. I mean, I, I, hold, hold up. Hold up. I understand they separate, <laughs> but they not. Yeah, no, they <laughs> absolutely not. You're, you're, you're making the point. Lauren was Greg, making go last, ahead. The, Lauren was making last week. It is the Black Caucus, but it's not ideologically rigid like this white nationalist extremist we're caucus not a known as the Freemans Caucus. Not a no, 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 right, exactly. Yeah. And I think that's the point being made. But if she is triangulated, if Ryan, if she's got enough votes from some of those folks who want Pelosi out, somebody's got to challenge Pelosi. If Fudge has the votes that are coming from beyond the Black Caucus, it is going to be very interesting because if she doesn't make 218, all bets are off. Now, we don't want to... Yeah, I, I, yeah. I, I, I got to get y'all take on this, folks. Yeah. The Congressional Black Caucus, folks, yesterday passed a vote of no confidence oh, in Democratic National Committee Chairman Tom Perez. Yeah. Now, it all centers around a number of issues, but the main issue was that Perez allowed the, the Democrats to get rid of superdelegates, which members of the CBC were. They were not happy about that. So basically what now happens is, in order to be a, CBC, in order to be a delegate, a superdelegate, that means members are not going to have to run against their own constituents. Cedric Richmond, who was the chair from New Orleans, he says that's grossly unfair. Now, let me give y'all some background, and I'm going to go to our panel real quick before we close this out. Here's the deal. Bernie's, Senator Bernie Sanders was blasted superdelegates but he felt it was unfair. But here's what most of y'all don't realize. He's not a Democrat. His first, yes, one, he's, he's not a Democrat. He's not a Democrat. Right. Right. But, but, but right. here's the piece. That's right. Here's the piece. Yeah. The superdelegate list was expanded after 1988 That's right. because That's right. of Reverend Jesse exactly. Lewis That's right. Jackson That's right. Sr. Reverend Jackson, after he came in second to Michael Dukakis, a lot of y'all don't know. Come on, bro. Okay. Reverend went essentially on a presidential bus tour yes. going down to Atlanta. 
Dukakis' campaign was mad as hell yep. because they felt he was getting too much attention. Yep. Reverend said, deal with it. Reverend Jackson had Ron Brown installed as chair of the Democratic National That's Committee. Right. That's right. It was Reverend Jackson, Ron Brown, Dr. Ron Walters, yes, and sir. Harold Ickes, yes, sir. who first of all changed the DNC rules to get rid of winner take all to proportional delegation. The reason y'all love Obama and him he became president is because of proportional delegation. If he if that doesn't get changed, he loses. Why? Because Hillary won Texas, Ohio, mm -hmm. Pennsylvania, California, and Nevada. She won the large states. Old rules, Obama's toast, Hillary is the nominee. But the superdelegates, Reverend Jackson, had that change where black political folks got more power in the party and not just black CBC members. It was black mayors. It was black county commissioners. That's right. And that's why the CBC members were angry when they changed the rules. But they said, how dare you usurp black authority to make Bernie Sanders happy, to Derek's point, when he wasn't even a Democrat. What do y'all make of the vote of no confidence of Tom Perez? Well, Tom that's Perez. damning. First of all, that's very damning because the black community is your base and you have to take care of them and Tom Perez not did you not. Take for granted, you don't have to take, take care of them. So when we it came... taken for granted and we got nowhere else to go. <laughs> when, it, when it comes to contracts, when it comes to staffing at the senior level, yeah, I just came off of Capitol Hill working for Senator James Langford. I was the only black communications director mm. in the entire Senate. Mm. The entire Senate. On either for the, side. Th on either side for mm. the three years that I was there. Mm. And so I think this is just yet another example of the DNC and the Democratic Party taking for granted black voters and black um, operatives in the party as well. So, but I do think it's very interesting. You do have a generational difference even within the black community. Mm. You have young black activists who got involved in politics because of Bernie Sanders, and they were railing against these superdelegates as well. Yeah. You Greg, it up. Greg, the Scott, Scott there. The Follow the next door. I remember 88 because I was in law school, and we worked on that Jackson campaign. You talk about voter education. Jesse Lewis Jackson knew how to talk to people, and he flipped a lot of young people in 84 and 88. And I remember how angry we were because we were going to Atlanta for a cold-blooded fight. We yep. thought Jesse was getting ready to do this thing. When they called that press conference and he said, I released my delegates to do caucus, we had to understand Jesse was playing the long game. This right now, we're in a similar moment. This party's going to have to decide what it's going to do. What Jesse Jackson did in 88 made Barack Obama possible. He should get on his knees and thank Jesse all the time. But my point is this. If they're smart now, Tom Perez is the past, man. This thing is about to have a sea change. This is the moment in when they're going to shape what this party's going to look. In all fairness, Scott Perez has his hands full, and from the moment he was elected, had his hands full. Well, remember, he, he didn't even want to run for it. Exactly. Yeah. Obama, Obama made him run exactly. to make sure Keith Ellison right. didn't win. That's and you right. got this far left wing of the Democratic Party <laughs> called Bernie Sanderites, yeah. who are driving at least half of the agenda, mm. and he's not a Democrat. He shouldn't be on the Democratic ticket next wow. time. But they've got to deal with this progressive left. And I know you hate that term, but that far, far left, they are trying to dominate. I don't hate the term. I know power. what the hell it means. <laughs> at the end of, at right the, end of the day, the, 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 when the oh, caucus sure needs to come together, they can demonstrate <laughs> that they can come together when they operate in African-American interest. But this is a game of chess. It goes back to right. the speaker race. That's right. You know, we're looking at one thing, and the real negotiating that's taking place is about something completely different. So we need to make sure that at the end of the day, if we're represented by members of the CBC, that they're playing chess, not checkers, and not being used as other people pawns. Gotcha. Right. Exactly. And also, Scott, when you get your own damn show, you can wear a sweater if you want to. I'm going to get I'm my just show saying, one day. Jane got your own. <laughs> help me. So that's, that's why you wear that tie as a panelist. <laughs> that's why All right, y'all. <laughs> let me give you an update on where we've been covering. No, no, no. Oh. Don't hate. It's see, I, your see knee. don't let me have to hit Mustard. you with the, Come the on. Oh, oh, here we go. See, don't start. <laughs> see, because see, your knees don't work. Oh. Your it's knees don't work. Oh. Hold up. Guess what? You go get your okay. cane. We're going to practice our count That's every time right. you drop. One, right. two. Right. All right. Let me give y'all an update. It's the story we've been following. Uh, this is the story out of the University of Texas at San Antonio. The president there has issued his final report. The teacher who uh, called the cops on the sister who had her feet up on the desk, yes. she's not going to be fired, but will be required to take training in classroom management. Now, here's the piece. The young woman who was thrown out did not consider the action racially motivated. Also, they interviewed every single student. All of the students in the class, they, they said they did not want her to be fired because they considered her to be a very good professor. They simply felt that she made a serious mistake in this particular case right 
here. So just so y'all understand that. All right. It's the regular feature on our show. Another crazy ass white woman. <laughs> okay. <laughs> this white woman here did not like the way a black woman exited a parking lot. So she called the police. After the black woman apologized, this happened. tell y'all why first of all we'll follow up as soon as we find out who that white woman is and when she lose her job because <laughs> y'all know this is gonna happen i can tell you how white people this is gonna end black unemployment Brother. i'm telling y'all right now <laughs> all right speaking of that hey who wants to work at comcast it's a job opening this comcast employee flashed a white supremacy sign <laughs> while wearing his comcast uniform his social media posts had a fair number of white nationalist posts guess what his dumb ass got fired. <laughs> okay, let, let, let me just help. Let me just help y'all out. If you're gonna be a racist, mm. it's a good bet not to have your company logo <laughs> seen in the photo. <laughs> Idiot. <laughs> Roll Rolls rules. Two. One. Two. <laughs> if you're gonna be a racist, <laughs> cover your face, cause we gonna track you down. Right. I'm telling y'all right now. Listen to me. The Nielsen Report is always shown. The Nielsen Report on, on African American consumers. Black people over-index on this mm -hmm. and this. Okay? 